Hello, everybody. I'm Fred Van Lenty, your guide to the comic book history of comics. And today we're going to take a look at Chapter 3, Two Feud. As the sound era in motion pictures was dawning, the field of the animated short film was an intensely competitive war of attrition in which two creative titans, Max Fleischer and Walt Disney, played the roles of opposing generals. Manhattan-based Fleischer Studios had dominated the silent era with its goofy black-and-white slapsticks and decidedly immigrant urban humor. But Disney's Hollywood studio had made the first popular sound cartoon, Steamboat Willie, which catapulted Mickey Mouse to superstardom. I imagine most of you have seen uh, at least some of Steamboat Willie, but those sounds you hear, the music and soon-to-be sound effects and Mickey's voice are originally provided by Walt Disney himself, were really something that blew away movie audiences when they first saw them uh, in the late 20s, and was definitely a gauntlet thrown down to his fellow cartoon makers. Max struck back, though, by securing, through Hearst's King Syndicate, the film rights to LZ Cigar's uh, excuse me, L.C. Seeger's comic strip Thimble Theater starring Popeye the Sailor. The cartoons were a smash hit, due in no small part to the Fleischer Brothers' bizarre hook that Popeye gained his super strength when he ate spinach. And uh, that connection with um, superhero comics we will be taking a look at just in a second. By the mid-1930s, uh, Popeye had put a significant dent in Mickey's popularity, but Disney out-innovated Max again, securing exclusive rights to a three-color Technicolor process that he showcased in his sumptuous Silly Symphony series. So while many of you may be already be familiar with Old Steamboat Willie, you might not be as familiar with the first Silly Symphony, uh, Flowers and Trees, which not only had this lovely score developed for the cartoon itself. In fact, the music was written and then the animators actually created the film to go along with it. Uh, for the first time, moviegoers were, were shown these lush colors um, in the three Technicolor process. The head of Technicolor, Cannelly, sold exclusive rights in cartoons to the three color Technicolor process to Walt. Um, other cartoon makers had to make do with the more primitive two color Technicolor. Moving right along here. Oh my gosh, what's happening? Though this struggle appears at first glance to lend itself to easy stereotypes, Jew versus Goy, immigrant versus native, gritty East Coast versus sunny West, there was a not insignificant difference. Austrian immigrant Max hailed from a decidedly middle-class background. His father owned an NYC tailor shop that specialized in women's writing habits. He boasted Rockefellers, Vanderbilts, and Astors among his clients. But native Midwesterner Disney suffered through a childhood almost Dickensian in its poverty. The family followed his father from state to state in one failed business venture after another. In Kansas City, Walt worked as a delivery boy for his dad's paper route. Succumbing at times to the grueling hours, he would pass out in chin-high snowdrifts during the punishing Missouri winters. Like many who escaped crushing poverty, Disney was filled with an indomitable drive to succeed at all costs and to keep firm control of his own destiny while doing so. When he couldn't find sound firms to do it up to his standards, he founded his own recording studio. Part of his legacy is L.A.'s Walt Disney Concert Hall. When he felt his staff's artistic skills weren't up to snuff, he paid for drawing instructors to come teach them for free on studio property. Disney also funded the California Institute of the Arts in his will. Though Disney kept scoring popular and critical successes with shorts like The Three Little Pigs, its theme, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf, became an anti-depression anthem, he spent so much money perfecting his films that the studio failed to break even. Not unaware of Walt's money troubles, Max believed his cheaper, more cost-conscious way of producing cartoons would ultimately seal Fleischer Studios' victory. He liked to say, you can't eat medals. Fleischer Studios occupied four floors of 1600 Broadway and employed about 250 people. One of the youngest was our hero, Jack Kurtzberg. Any illusions Jack might have had about the glamour of creating cinematic magic were quickly dispelled. The Fleischers imposed a strict hierarchy on the artists in what was known as the head animator system. The former Coco, Max Brothers Dave, a Fleischer producer, 
would give a rough plot to the head animator who would break it into scenes. Experienced animators drew the crucial or key poses in any given scene, while, the, while apprentice artists called in-betweeners drew all the figures that led up to, then away from, the key poses. Jack was an in-betweener. All he drew was movement. I hated it, remembered. It reminded me of the sweat stop, sweatshops where my father worked. But his $15 a week paycheck was too critical to his family's survival to even contemplate quitting. And to give you kind of an idea of the kind of things that uh, Jack was drawing here uh, is, a, is an in-betweener sketch of Mr. Popeye by Mr. Kurtzberg, uh, who you may know through a more famous name. Hint, 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 foreshadowing. The fluid anarchic combat of a Popeye cartoon was produced in a rigid, tedious process by hundreds of low-wage workers. The super strength and action are absolutely sensational. This is really great, but what if it featured a straight adventure character? Fleischer Popeyes inspired Jerry Siegel to consider new forms of drawn violence in Cleveland. And here is the very first Popeye cartoon. I alluded to it earlier. This is uh, when Betty Boop was the big Fleischer star. She actually introduced Popeye in his first cartoon, but he immediately gets into combat here with Pluto. And you guys have to understand, we all, you know, grow up on the Marvel uh, movies now and Superman and, and all that stuff. Uh, but this was the first time you really saw superhuman feats of strength and combat in a film medium. And it predates the superheroes themselves and very much inspired uh, Jerry Siegel, at least, First trip, uh, he was gonna start working on here pretty soon. So, Popeye is definitely, in that sense, very much a proto superhero. While in New York, a real life labor battle commenced. In 1937, over 100 Fleischer employees joined the Commercial Artists and Designers Union. Max saw their demands, such as paid sick leave and vacations, reducing the 45 hour work week and so on, as an unforgivable betrayal. He refused to recognize the CADU and fired 15 union labor organizers. On May 7th, the remaining unionists declared a strike and blocked the studio entrance. And they literally sang such things as, I'm Popeye the Union Man. And they had placards like, I make millions left, but the real joke is our salaries. Can't get much spinach for $15 a week. You get the idea. When non-union animators tried to cross the picket lines to enter the studio, a fight broke out. The NYBD tried to move the lines back and things got really ugly. 2,000 gawkers gathered to cheer on the ensuing riot, which ended only when 10 artists were hauled off in a paddy wagon. The newly created National Labor Relations Board had come in and to negotiate a settlement, which Max reluctantly agreed to on October the 13th. Oops, I turned the wrong page, sorry. Just in time to absorb the thundering shock that was Walt's latest and most decisive salvo against his rivals. A project that had been in development for so long, since 1933 in fact, it was derided throughout Hollywood as Disney's Folly, a feature-length cartoon entitled Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And Ryan is presented here for us actual dwarf concepts that were never used in the film, such uh, classics as chesty, blabby, dirty, awful, scrappy, puffy, jaunty, shorty, and my favorite, Big O Ego. Walt's drive towards perfection intensified during the making of Snow White. He cast animators to work on characters he thought reflective of their individual personalities, for example. Walt's staff was under such intense pressure to outdo themselves with the realism of the animation that irony of ironies they used Fleischer's rotoscope process in several key scenes. The argument against cartoon features had always been that they wouldn't be able to sustain audience interest, because the public wouldn't be able to identify with drawn characters the way they do with live actors. They couldn't feel real emotion for cartoon people in their dramatic struggles. When Snow White opened on December 21st, 1937, it blew that misconception out of the water. At the premiere, the audience, which included screen legends Clark Gable and Carol Lombard, started bawling during Snow's funeral scene. Disney's deification was complete. Critics hailed Snow White as cinema's most important achievement since Griffith's Birth of a Nation. The Daily Worker praised the dwarves as a miniature communist society. More importantly, from the point of view of the studios, Snow White became history's highest grossing feature though Gone with the Wind would surpass it, would surpass it in 1940. Fleischer, Studio, Fleischer Studios distributor Paramount had always resisted Max's pleas for a feature-length cartoon. Now, however, studio head Adolf Zuckar demanded one. To quickly crank out a full-length movie, Max would have to triple his staff. 
Still smarting from the strike, he decided to relocate his studio from labor-friendly New York to Pro Management Miami, which offered Max generous tax incentives to build a $300,000 complex there. Despite his earlier misgivings, Jack considered relocating to Florida along with a lot of the other employees, but his mother refused to let him go. On May 27, 1938, the Manhattan doors of Fleischer Studios closed for good, leaving scores of cartoonists like Jack Kurtzberg out of work awaiting a new medium we'll have to find out in our next episode which is more action fun thanks for listening and uh, you can get the complete comic book history of comics in readable book format from this week thanks a lot Thank you.